Um, thank you all so much for making time. Um, I want to start by acknowledging um, the uh, land on which some of us are, uh, which is to say the um, Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and also to acknowledge sea country. Um, the rights have never been ceded um, and uh, it is land and sea that will and always will be Aboriginal. Um, uh, I want to thank Tom and the SEI um, who um, had planned a wonderful launch with sustainable fish canapes. So, you know, think sardine rillettes and little anchovy things. All right, faux anchovies for all you vegans that should be eating anchovies. Um, but no, there we go. So um, I'm open for deliveries. <laughs> I'll get on my back right now. <laughs> um, so a little bit of the history of this project. Um, it came um, from an ARC grant I had uh, several years ago called Sustainable Production and Consumption of Fish. And then Kate Johnson, yay, uh, before she was a mother, <laughs> when she was just Kate, without Tilda, sad days, um, came on board as research associate. Um, and she basically kick-started and organized uh, the conference that was called Sustaining the Seas. Um, and um, that's where um, the papers came from. Um, unfortunately, some couldn't. We had some wonderful papers from uh, Torres Strait Islander traditional owners. Um, and others. But as it is, uh, if you look at the list of contents, there's a lot of chapters. Um, so I really, really cannot um, under emphasize the incredible role that Kate Johnson, Drs. Kate Johnson and Nancy Lee uh, did in bringing this book together. They each have um, their own brilliant chapters. Nancy's on uh, late nights and live tanks um, at the Golden Century, which she uh, conducted some wonderful um, interviews. And um, Kate, along with Susie, um, oh God, I'm blanking Susie's last name, uh, Su uh, Su Suzanne Pratt, um, on their speculative har harboring, which they actually did during the conference. Um, so yeah, it was it was a wonderful conference, um, and we were really happy to meet um, oh a lot of people from South Africa. Unfortunately, it's six o'clock in the morning there, um, and and elsewhere that came together, and it was a real mixture of artists, writers, um, and um, practitioners. Um, NGOs, um, you know, it, it really, really was a very multidisciplinary conference, as is this book, um, indeed. And many GCS uh, contributed, um, so um, Estrida, Arum, um, Sue was there, um, anyway, too many to mention. Now, as to this, um, Zoom launch. Um, I am going to hand over now to um, Kate, oops, Tess Lee, who is an associate professor and person extraordinaire in our department, who so very kindly agreed to moderate a panel with three of our authors. Um, I can't <laughs> tell you how busy Tess is. Um, so I mean, if, if you looked at the pictures, that's fine, Tess. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have um, Alana Mann, who is an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the University of Sydney. And her chapter was on the production of small scale fisheries in global policy making through food um, sovereignty. So an interesting move from Alana's previous research, which was worth with the Via Campesina um, and more terrestrial forms to looking at um, small scale fisheries. 
um, Amaya Sanchez uh, Velasco and her team. Uh, where's Amaya? Amaya, I can't see you. Um, so, um, oh, there you are. Where, 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 where'd you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> so, um, 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 Amaya has the Grandeza studio at UTS and um, her paper was on the South Korean reef metropolis. Again, fascinating about artificial reefs. And Adriana Verhez, Adriana, is there somewhere? Oh, there you are. Um, uh, Adriana and her team uh, from New South Wales um, to have a chapter on Operation Crayweed, merging art and science to restore underwater forests. Um, and again, just an amazing um, uh, practice. changing worlds and at a time when these radical changes are right now in a really stiff competition for our attention so there was something about that I can't do this in the way that I want to um, and us having to do it like this which actually in a funny kind of way sings to what uh, the book is pointing to which is the invisibility amongst other things of issues under the water um, you know we're, we're for for those of us who care about environments, the charisma of what's happening in land-based um, ecologies takes more centre ground, in, particularly in terms of media uptake and storytelling, than what's going on in our hinterlands and hinter seas. And interestingly, gender and cultural studies has been a pivot place for thinking about that issue. And at the same time, COVID-19 has replaced our concern about fires but it's also increased cynicism about the role of policy and expertise and scholarship like you can hear hear it in the way that the universities are being like well okay so you're losing money who cares um, or you can also hear it in the critique coming back at see our economy has been trashed this is what happens when you listen to experts and by the way look at how the economy was trashed this is a taste for what all of those eco people would have us do in terms of you know denying fossil fuels and so forth so i this this book could not be more timely in terms of the many intersecting issues that it picks up um, so the oceans and its dependence and its entanglements well, of course, they also struggle with another issue, and which is that it hosts sites and species that are already our other. This is something that Elspeth's work also points to, you know, the alien um, of the fish or the alien of the critters that we can't see or have names for. They are our outer space on Earth, and they have these populations that humans think can just be extracted. So the collection touches on all of those issues, reasons for despair, but also talks about reasons for hope and asks these great questions. Can humans undo the damages that we have prosecuted on systems that exceed our human-centred powers? And that's important to note because the term sustaining seas as opposed to sustaining the seas, as the introduction notes, actually dislodges the idea that humans alone are the ones with any agency here. But nonetheless, we confront these issues like species depletion and acidification and old liberal governance mechanisms that have failed us and the conventional forms of scientific description that have failed us. So this book also speaks to that. It speaks to the need for new discipline perspectives and new styles of storytelling, new forms of narration to give voice to things that we find very easy not to have empathy with so these beyond human life worlds 
the ability to feel, to emphasise, these places that challenge us um, to, to, to think with and among because they are our alien spaces. The book confronts those issues and tackles another one because if you tell those stories too harshly, as perhaps it would be my want, that can be paralysing. So the book harnesses these different disciplinary perspectives to bring in new ways of narrating the seas to new readers. So I want to begin, actually, by asking our authors to think on this issue of the writing to solicit new readers to consider issues that are always out of sight, out of mind, over there, not in my everyday. So thinking about what for you was the most significant writing challenge uh, in relationship to your work on watery matters. So I want to, that's, that's the big challenge or big question for you all, but Alana, I want to begin with you, beginning with your narrative challenge and what, what in particular in telling policy stories, which can be, as I know, really dry and arcane into something relatable, um, given that your contest was with the charisma and the visibility of land-based livelihood threats over the sea-based ones. So was that your big writing challenge or something else? Unmute yourself, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tess. And thank you, Elspeth, um, Kate and Nancy, because I want to start by saying writing this chapter was a real pleasure and I don't think you can always say that when you're working um, on a big edited collection with a whole bunch of people. Um, it's just wonderful to work with your friends and colleagues but also with people who are so gracious and also just so um, meticulous. I, I've been enjoying reading everybody's chapters for days. I don't think I've found an error yet. And I hate to say that, but you know, when we write books, we're always looking for the looking for the typo. And I just I just think it's beautiful. And the myriad of different styles uh, really talk to what Tess to what Tess mentioned about, you know, a lot of the books about entanglement. And I think the way that the chapters weave these different stories from different disciplinary perspectives is just so powerful. And I've never been part of a collection that is so eclectic. And I, I just think that's such a wonderful way to have impact as well, because there's something, something for everyone in that book. And it takes you into some other places that you don't usually go. And yes, writing this chapter did take me into some different places, very much so, because it made me realise it's something I knew, which was there is a big gap in policy making, particularly around the small scale farmers and fisher movement via Campesina, which as Elspeth mentioned, I've been studying for a long time. I've been, um, my first work, my PhD was on food sovereignty movements. And um, it's amazing how land centric they have been. And that really kind of contested my own journey as a scholar, because as I've um, also often discussed with um, Elspeth, I actually come from a fishing family. So I come from a, a family of, you know, a charter boat fishing family in Queensland, in Harvey Bay near Fraser Island. So my family, we did whale watching and we grew up working on the boats. And here I was, here I was, you know, 30 years later embarking on an academic career, working on something that was really uh, important to me, which was food systems and equity and um, food security. But I, I really didn't think about the seas and I didn't think about about fish for a long time until I participated in the conference and started looking at how does La Via Campesina really engage with this issue uh, of food sovereignty in relation to oceans because just to give give people a bit of background on Via Campesina it, it's um the Peasant Way, it's a farmers movement that started in 1993. It originated um, out of uh, 
group of farmers who were small, medium sized producers, particularly in Latin America, but also in Europe, uh, they realised that with the formation of the World Trade Organisation out of the Uruguay round, that their, their um, rights and their agendas would not be represented in global policy making. So they basically created La Via Campesina, which claims to represent about 200 million uh, farmers, landless workers and fisher folk. And so whenever you talk about them, you talk about this huge diversity of, um, of if you like, um, members. Um, having said that, a lot of these, a lot of these um, people may not necessarily identify with the movement. So that's, that's something I was studying, you know, what does food sovereignty mean to different people in different countries and contexts? And so I was talking to people in my research, like grain growers, um, pro producers, um, cattle farmers in Spain, all sorts of, all sorts of people who were doing um, land-based um, agriculture. And as I say in the chapter, La Via Campesina acknowledged in 2012 that they had neglected the oceans and that they had not done a lot of work on small scale fishes. They'd been working at the UN on progressing a really important framework called the um, Peasants' Rights, the um, Declaration for Peasant Rights, which was all about the fact that small scale farmers, migrant workers, landless people were so marginalized in global policy making. So when I, when I started doing the research for my presentation at the conference and then for the chapter, I quickly, um, you know, realised that that yes, there is a there is a huge gap here in in um, certainly La Via Campesina's formulating around the concept of agroecology, which is very central to food sovereignty, which means that you really care about um, alternatives to industrial agriculture. It means you you look about look after the land. You're a steward of the land, if you like. So the politics of care notion in this book really resonates with that concept of food sovereignty and I was delighted to find that there's a parallel concept to agroecology that's called aqua ecology so that's what my chapter is about and it very much engages with the key element of agroecology which is not just about an alternative to conventional industrial agriculture in terms of not having um, harmful inputs in terms of you know, engaging with a lot of um, First Nations understandings also about land management. It's got that real political edge, which I think is the really important element of agroecology, that the mainstream um, policy, even food and agriculture organisation policy, often likes to or, or just tends to sidestep because it's too difficult. And that's about participatory grassroots governance models that includes the voices of of the people, the voices of the peasants, and in this case, the voices of the fisher. Yeah. I told you to unmute and there I was banging on. Thank you. That was a really great introduction to a taste for people who may um, still have the pleasure awaiting them of encountering this book and your chapter. I want to turn to Team Ariana, which, and it is a team, so, um, of, of both in the research and in the authorship, which, and it speaks of an arts meets science collaboration, which also enlisted publics to care about the disappearance of the seaweed forests along the Great Southern Reef. And the Great Southern Reef, it turns out, incorporates Sydney and beyond. It actually changed, by the way, um, I was really mindful on my weekend pilgrimage, I always swim between, um, Manly Surf Lifesaving Club and Shelley Beach and back. And I actually paid attention far more to the seaweed than the gropers this time. And I thought, mm. oh, <laughs> I think I know who I can thank for the fact that these seaweeds actually now are here for me to look at. Um, so the forests are this unknown, a part of the, are as unknown, sorry, and as vital as this unknown and extensive reef system which gets shadowed by the Great Barrier Reef and its problems. So I wanted team Ariana to talk about why the science art collaboration mattered as you wrangled with those disappearances and also what worked and didn't work. Um, not just in terms of the research you did, but what works and what didn't work as an authorship or representation 
um, collective. You know, you're trying to, because that has its own promises and new politics. So you're corralling different ways of telling the story um, about hope amid reasons for despair. So um, just to fill people in, the chapter also talks about the disappearance of, of good news stories, because when you do tell stories about um, the sea, the media can latch on to a story of disappearance more easily than they can latch on to a story of the work and the labours of care that might be doing restorative work. It's just not as newsworthy. Uh, so this issue of charisma, anyway, I would really like you to talk about disappearances, what worked, what didn't work, the collective, the corralling, if you don't mind. Thank you, Tess, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, book launch. Um, it's very exciting, and thank you for the invitation to be part of the book. So I very much echo Alana's comment about how interdisciplinary and how eclectic the book is. Um, for me, I'm, I'm an ecologist, I'm a marine ecologist. I, I normally work with numbers. I write a lot of articles, but you know, scientists, we have a very specific way of writing, which is, you know, use as few words as possible, there's an introduction, there's a method, there's results, there's discussion, it's very, very formulaic. Um, and it's all evidence-based, you know, I do an experiment, I have a hypothesis, what does it tell me? So, um, the conference um, and, and the book for me was an invitation to kind of step out of that kind of the normal way of working as a scientist and engage in, in a more kind of in a different way. Like, to be honest, I didn't know that people cared about the oceans so deeply, you know, from the humanities. And, and, and it was a real it's been a real learning process for me, both the conference and then reading um, the chapters in book. And since the conference, other kind of collaborations have emerged as well. Now, um, this book chapter was is the first time that I have um, co-authored anything with, with an artist. So there's um, two artists that we've been collaborating with, Jennifer Turpin and Kelly Crawford. And they've been a really big part of Operation Craywitch, which is this uh, restoration project where we're bringing back a species that was extinct. It disappeared off the Sydney coastline. It was gone for 40 years mm -hmm. and it was out of sight, out of mind. It actually took us 20 years to even realize that it had gone missing. Um, and us as scientists, we developed a method to bring it back and we succeeded. And then we very quickly realized, you know, this is a very important story. It's a good news environmental project. Can we use this to actually raise awareness about the importance of seaweed forests more broadly? And, and, and that's what we kind of wanted to do. So we, we created a, a project, we created a website, we created a logo, Operation Crayway. Um, but we realized that to connect with people um, as scientists, we can, we can tell all the facts we want. I can tell you how many species are supported by seaweed forests. And you know, the fact that they support our most valuable fisheries in the whole of Australia, you know, rock lobster and abalone. I can tell you that they capture carbon and that they're very important in the context of climate change, etc. But unless we make people feel something, that information just doesn't really stick. Um, and that's where the collaboration with the artists came in. So back in the day when we first started, so we proved, we demonstrated that we could bring Crayweed back. Then we created a crowdfunding campaign to raise awareness about the disappearance of this forest. Uh, imagine losing 70 kilometers of forest on land. Everybody would be up in arms, right? But because it was happening on the water, even though it was right next to Australia's biggest city, nobody knew about it. So we did this campaign to try and raise awareness and raise money. So we did a crowdfunding campaign. It was just before Christmas. And we asked people to give an underwater tree for Christmas. And you could donate $20 to the project or 50 or 500. And we would use this money to bring Crayweed back. And we're still doing that. The, the restoration is ongoing. We now have 12 sites and you know, we're still working on this. Um, but um, Jennifer Turpin, an artist that is also, um, she, she works a lot with nature. She's worked a lot with water. And I met her at a conference and she really fell in love with this idea of, of underwater gardening and, and recovering habitats in this way. So when she saw the campaign, the crowdfunding campaign, 
she thought, oh, maybe this is something that we could that we could work on together. And she was invited, she received a Helen Lempriere um, scholarship to be part of Sculptures by the Sea in 2016. And, and decided why not focus this um, installation for Sculptures by the Sea, why not link it to this underwater restoration concept? And that's what she did, uh, along with Michele Crawford. Um, and it was, uh, it was so much fun to work with them and to collaborate with them. And I feel like I learned a lot. We, you know, they're just incredible uh, people there. Um, they organized this kind of huge participatory art experience. So it wasn't a sculpture that they created that symbolized the restoration. We actually did, we actually restored a forest in Bondi, which is to this day, it's actually Bondi is our most successful site. And then they marked the, they outlined the restoration site with a beautiful yellow fence that um, symbolized like a work site. Like in a building site, you'd have like a fence that would, you know. So they wanted to basically make the world, the work that we were doing on the water visible uh, to the people above. So, um, and we collaborated with schools. There was more than a hundred children involved. We did a series of art meet science workshops. So we showed them the micro microscopic creatures that live in the seaweed. And then they made wearable art costumes in the shape of those creatures. And then they paraded them um, along the shoreline. And it was actually the beginning of a collaboration that is ongoing to this day. So we've continued to work together. And as we add new restoration sites, uh, we have created new um, artistic ways of showing um, what we're doing and to connect uh, local communities with um, the <laughs> local communities with um, what's happening in their marine backyard. And the idea here is that we're raising the levels of stewardship. You know, people can't care about something unless they know it. So this, um, through art, we're bringing it closer to people. That's, um, I'm hoping that people listening are getting excited, more and more excited about the possibilities and the richness um, to be delved into with this book. Um, well, that was a very exciting chapter for me, as, as all of them are. Um, now, Amaya tackles a very different uh, approach to managing the superior visibility of land-based over sea-based developments, um, which is to turn to a government which is doing the same thing. It's an extraordinary story of the South K Korean government turning its sea areas into a different kind of met metropolis. Um, so this is a story of engineering the natural environment to form complex assemblies and actually like the built forms for human inhabitants. Uh, it's a, a form of engineering and housing which favours certain species and their tactics and disfavours others. So, you know, we, we, we still have hierarchies. We almost have class systems or species speciesism um, happening in these engineered environments. So the structural challenge in this watery environment really fascinated me because um, my work, Liam's online here with us today as well with Liam Greeley, we look at how the how water is this active ingredient in decomposing um, land-based structures and housing, you know, the, the, the part which pulls, the thing that pulls housing apart but is also essential to their existence is water. Um, so with, you know, Liam's concept, which I find really fruitful to think with, is to think about housing as um, a membrane because it's permeable and interacting with water. But here the structural challenge is actually to find built forms in this um, underwater metropolis for other species that actually don't decay too fast and are not too toxic uh, in terms of the reef buildings that they're creating given the inevitability of their decomposition. So a twist on my writing question for you is, how do you balance the economical narrative forms with the need to roam over so many disciplinary knowledges to understand these formations that you're grappling with? So to put that more simply, how do you both skirt over and dive deep into infrastructures and military geostrategy and human other relations and more? What were the frustrations and pleasures of that? 
And you have Hello, to everyone. And thank you so much for having me uh, presenting today. And thank you for all the hard work uh, behind the, the book as well. Um, I would like to, maybe in response to your question, test uh, to talk about precise this multiscalar reading no? and how architecture uh, often operates across different scales. No? We have the, from the territorial uh, to the kind of the construction detail and the human scale. And in a way what the paper is trying to do through looking at uh, these artifacts no? that populate uh, and, and almost extract or, or turn the, the ocean into a really extractive environment in, in the case of South Korea, is to show how every build environment has an ideological project behind. And uh, calling this urban, underwater urban development uh, a reef metropolis, in a way, was uh, the intention behind that was to, uh, to break the divide between overwater and underwater and to really push the boundaries of what architecture can mean, no? Because we have the tendency, I'm an architect in the field of architecture and urban design to only consider that architecture is whatever is designed for humans and then uh, any other form of construction uh, is not architecture, right? So uh, in a way, this paper is a, is a cry for <laughs> paying attention of how we are actually transforming our environment, no? And which are the, the ideologies that are driving this development? Because if, uh, you, as you were saying, these underwater structures are designed to host the most valuable species uh, to be then sold, we are shaping the underwater environment with a very extractivist uh, intention, right? In order to capitalize the most of it. So I think that uh, we are in a moment in which it's shift and, and the way that we approach uh, the ocean should really uh, challenge the way that we have approached the exploitation of the land and that, so that we don't perpetuate uh, the, the, the kind of the really industrialized view on, on the environment. So yeah, this idea of, uh, of how we have been neglecti neglecting the oceans uh, is really crucial for the, for the um, paper. Another aspect that, is, uh, that has been central to, to this paper that was uh, the first of a series of projects in relation to the ocean is the project of imagination and the project of political imagination. No? If, uh, as I was saying, every space, every city and every architectural uh, design is somehow a theatrical stage for forms of living, no? for a particular type of ideology for, to orchestrate uh, different forms of relationship between actors, no? between humans, between humans and non-humans, just between non-humans. If we are creating these theatrical stages, the tools of architectural representation, no? like uh, because we are a very visual discipline, uh, can allow to push the boundaries of how, uh, of these imaginaries, no? of which worlds we want to design, how we want to live, how we want to coexist with other species. So um, after this project, uh, actually, uh, that was centered in Korea, the next project that I work with, with my team, with Grandeza and Bajeza at UTS, was uh, focusing on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia as well, and trying to, through the project of imagination, deconstruct this idea of the pristine and the, the fact that nature is something out there, and trying to look at the reef as a space of productive, as a space of production, no? That has completely intertwined networks of tourism, uh, mm, of uh, the, all the extraction of coal along the coast, corridors to transport and trade, and really breaking the divide between whatever is happening on the water and, and all the catchment area of the reef that is uh, extremely connected, right? So we presented this project as, a, as the Australian Pavilion in, in Milan, uh, in the Triennale, and, and it was also focusing on this idea of how to reinvent 
uh, modes of living that are not uh, based on the extraction and the exploitation of both the environment and the bodies no, that occupy the environment, both human and not human. So I don't know if I derived from your question, <laughs> maybe a little bit. I got too excited. <laughs> Um, it was great. What I am going to ask you, though, to do, Amaya, is I've had the privilege of reading the chapter. Could you just scene set for our listeners who haven't, um, who might not know what we're talking about? Because, so just say what the South Korean government is doing and what, what is happening under the sea. Okay. Yeah, maybe I have some slides. Oh, great. Share the screen and they put together. Yeah, you should uh, be able so... to share. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So these images might uh, clarify what I was uh, talking about. So this is the region of um, South Korea, right? And, and North Korea. So it's a peninsula, as you all know, and in a way, after the Korean War in 1953, uh, we all know about the demilitarized zone uh, between the, the two countries, but there is also an area of struggle between the two countries in the, in the maritime zone. So um, after the war, there was a huge um, rural exodus into the cities, and this is a moment in which Seoul really started to become a metropolis, no? a global metropolis that developed its urbanism in a really fast way and actually, uh, interestingly enough, utilizing the same, um, the same materials that are used to construct these underwater structures that, uh, that we were researching. So another factor that is really uh, interesting in this case study is that uh, when the exclusive economic zones were extended to 200 uh, nautical mines, what happened with Korea, with North and South Korea, is that they, their, ocean, their seas became enclosed seas because mm -hmm. in, in this process of the exclusive economic areas of Japan and, Ch and China trapped the ocean. So this made that, in a way, the, the, the international waters were not as accessible for the, for the fishing industry. And therefore, they had to find a way to uh, increase the productivity of their own oceans because the, there is a, a big percentage of the protein in the, in the Korean diet that is coming from the oceans. So um, on the one hand, we were looking at this case study as an, uh, as the, from the ideological point of view to see what are the geographical and legislative constraints in the area, to see how South Korea as a country is kind of uh, defining itself as a metropolitan project inland, but also how there is a whole uh, institutional narrative to frame the sea of Korea as in its new continent. No? How this uh, idea that the country is trapped around uh, not only the ocean, but also ideologically trapped no? in relation to the, in its neighbors, how to expand and, and, and somehow see the ocean and as this space almost for conquering, no? like a really, uh, with a really intense geopolitical uh, position. And they're doing this, as I was saying, through universities, through developing a lot of institutional uh, projects that relate about like the development of na the naval industry, no? all the uh, ships, but also uh, engineering and like uh, aquaculture, uh, etc. And how they develop this to a kind of uh, reef urbanism. So part of this ideological vision, uh, this is one of the representation tools that they're using, that they're actually inverting the globe map. As a, uh, and they were distributing this, um, this image in, in the parliament in a way as an ideological tool to say that Korea wasn't trapped and that actually the oceans were there to kind of expand their, their boundaries. 
and focusing in the a, a little bit more into the closed scale as i was saying there is a, an area because the whole peninsula is surrounded uh, to, um, by the construction of artificial reefs but this particular area is a moment in which this condition becomes particularly intense because there was a clear agreement in the in the marit in the ter ter in the terrestrial border but this agreement hasn't happened yet in the maritime boundary no so there is this kind of intermediate space of legislative blur blurriness in which uh, north korea is selling licenses to chinese fishing boats to operate in the area and uh, it uh, the united nations is persecuting uh, these boats that cannot operate there so it it becomes a really uh, militarized zone in which the different conf uh, uh, in which there is a huge conflict of interest between the countries that have access to it right so and there is a big shift in which uh, this very intangible border you know, this 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 blurriness um, is addressed by south korea and it's the moment in which they decide to submerge these structures that that you are seeing on the screen that this is a an artificial dome that is designed with a double agenda because on the one hand it's designed to host this um, really valuable species uh, for example the the blue crab no that is uh, really uh, set a, a type of um, seafood that uh, is really appreciated both in north and south korea so it's on the one hand a dwelling uh, form of underwater architecture but on the other hand they're also designed to cut the nets of the uh, boats operating in the area. So it becomes a military artifact. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the paper, what it's trying to do is to look at this, this artifact and from the, from the small scale uh, to the geopolitical scale to understand how actually South Korea is utilizing urbanism and, and using the tools of architectural and urban development in the, in the construction of its uh, on the one hand, geopolitical project, but also in the in the kind of the in the industrialization of it. And in terms of the construction of it, it is a, a as Tess was saying in the, in the introduction, it is designed to be resistant and and kind of aggressive towards this fishing activity of those that uh, are operating in the area to protect uh, the re the marine resources, but um, it is also constructed to slowly degrade. No? Mm. So in a way, uh, these artifacts are uh, allowing us to, to interrogate uh, preconceptions around the division between nature and culture, uh, preconceptions around how we develop our environment under uh, extractivist logics no? of, of really exploiting the territory, and preconceptions about what is architecture uh, and what is not, no? and how we can shift our thinking by really understanding uh, how these uh, structures operate. Thank you so much. Now, people have got a really, um, even with that in-depth presentation, a quick taste of what this book has got to offer. Um, layers upon layers upon layers. I was enchanted and entranced and I learned a lot. Um, I'm you. really grateful for all the authors and for Elspeth and um, all your team. It's just, it really is an extraordinary intervention. So I want to finish because I know we've got to create space for, um, you know, more dialogue, but a question to you all, if there's a key message that you wanted people to take away from your research on things see, mm. What would that be? Now, epigram, Alana. <laughs> well, uh, that's a that's a. I think there's so many great messages in the book, and I feel like I feel like the what I'm going to mention is actually um, covered by a few people. But there's a wonderful synergy between our chapters as well. I think that, you know, I've had a lot of my questions answered about my own work through reading some of the other chapters, and one of my key points was that 
recognising the impact of um, some of the no fish policies on the people who actually, you know, need the seas for their livelihoods. So I feel like this is something that um, ha resonates it resonates throughout the book is that we need to be very, very careful about how we do, um, I guess, respect the diversity of stakeholders. It's a terrible word, but really the, the number of people who do have a vested interest and do care very deeply for the oceans and for the bodies in the oceans and the bodies on the land that those species feed. So this is where I, I, you know, the liminal space between the land and the sea, which I feel like, I feel is, is still for me shifting in my thinking around certainly the concept of food sovereignty and what it means in the sea, such a different concept. The, we have to be very careful about how non-government organisations, for example, um, conservation efforts, and also, of course, how the carbon economy, the blue carbon economy, um, purports to protect oceans and protect species and protect ecosystems, but actually does a lot of damage to the communities that have lived in those, those places and that really need those um, resources for their food security. So. Others who want to take up my invitation, what's the key message you want people to take away from your research on all things sea? Um, from my perspective, um, it's an optimistic message. Um, our work shows that if we give nature a helping hand, its ability to help itself is actually huge. And I think this COVID era is a really good example of that. Um, you know, like we've all seen um, examples of just nature just taking over. Um, I'm from Barcelona originally, and you know, there's 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 all these videos of of wild animals that usually are in the in the mountains, and they're coming in, they're taking over, and nature does have that um, that ability. And for us, yes, there's, there's a, we we brought a species to extinction in Australia's uh, largest city, and we are now bringing it back. And we actually, we all we're doing is giving it a little push, and then it actually, the, like the, the reforesting happens by itself. <clears throat> so yeah, we need to continue to raise awareness and yeah, have you know listen more to the optimistic uh, or the the positive stories of of positive change because. They are there and, and we don't make enough room for them. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. I will I there? Uh, add to uh, these two interesting takes <laughs> from Adriana and Alana that to me, and something I think that this is something that has been uh, even more uh, visible with the COVID 19 crisis is that. Um, it's a really exciting moment. It's a really hard moment at the time, no? but it's also a really exciting moment to really think of a structural change that uh, needs to happen. No? In Australia, we not only had the, I mean, we have been lucky until now with the COVID-19, but the recent fires and the, and the degradation on the Great Barrier Reef are really uh, examples that even if they're like really uh, frustrated no? and really sad. I think that they should give us the energy to really uh, engage and to, and to kind of engage from my perspective uh, in this expansion of what the political imaginaries can be. No? Because with, uh, if we continue with a economic system that is based on, on continuous growth and destruction, uh, that is a capitalist system, uh, we are not going to be here <laughs> for a long time. At least uh, it's going to impact uh, not uh, the whole globe equally, but it's putting a lot of people in danger. No? So I think that in a way it's exciting because we, uh, it's not about being nostalgic and, and kind of recuperating other for previous forms of living. It's about really imagining how we can live together differently and uh, 
I consider this a, an urgent, an urgent question. So, to me, what is important is this, this kind of will to engage in the conversation. Mm -hmm. That's a great pivot point. I'm going to um, throw to Elspeth because um, I wouldn't mind that question also going to you as a key kind of person, node person for this collection. What's the key message you want to take uh, people to take home and then let's open it up to questions yeah. from the group. Well, um, thank you all and Tess for your um as Kane texted me, you're ecstatic sharing. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> genuinely excited by this thing. You gave me this task and sort of, <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things, of course, is the somewhat banal statement that you know, people of very different disciplines can work together and can learn from each other um, and get excited. Um, and that you know, was so evident at the conference, um, the, the kind of buzz, which then I hope readers can, can kind of pick up on in the book. Um, and, you know, I've banged on about this before, but you know, uh, complexity is sexy. Um, you know, stop dumbing down messages. I mean, as, as Alana, alluded to, you know, easy NGO messages of, you know, marine parks work always. Well, no, they don't work always. Depends where they are. Um, you know, don't eat fish. Well, it depends on which fish, you know. And I think that together, um, you know, the humanities, social sciences with our scientific colleagues um, can uh, really do come together at that point. Because as Adriana says, you know, she does, you know, proper um, empirical research, evidence-based, um, but that we can then take and, you know, like in other chapters, um, artists will, will go in a totally different way with that. So that's kind of what I would like to say. I just like to bring in Nancy and um, and Kate because you did do so much on this. And just, you know, what are your thoughts? You have to unmute Kate and Nancy. Kate. I don't think I have that much more to add. Um, the other put <laughs> it so well. Um, and and yeah, I do I do second your your point about working interdisciplinary really. Um, it was such a lovely um, job to, to have to read all those chapters and and um, I just really enjoyed dipping into all these different worlds and ways of seeing things. Um, hi. I've, I've been a little bit distracted because I have a baby who's not going to sleep. I'm just <laughs> bragging that she's really good. I can just put her down. So I'm a little bit distracted. Um, but likewise, for me, the, for me um, what was really like a great sort of experiment with this interdisciplinary gathering. And, you know, I think it's fabulous that that could then come together in a book. Um, and one of the um, challenges was to bring in all these different kind of writing styles, like Adriana said, um, you know, she's used to writing science articles and we had artists who are used to writing in a certain style or, or not writing and, you know, um, just sort of displaying their, their work and that was really um, interesting as editors to kind of um, allow for that diversity but sort of somehow kind of bring it together. Um, but key messages that haven't been said, I guess, um, I think I might have to ponder that a little bit, a bit more, but um, maybe something like, in the beginning, Tess, you, you talked about that invisibility and I think just the importance of continually recognising that there's, there's, there's so much, whether it's under the sea or on the land, that's invisible. And as researchers, we need to just keep pursuing that. And um, yeah, I don't know, that's as good as I'll get this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to say when um, 
in response to Alana saying that she couldn't find any typos, Rowan, Roman and Littlefield were, were fantastic in many regards. Um, and I quite honestly uh, recommend them. And they took on this sort of slightly shaggy dog of a project. Um, but all the way along, the, it was onto us. So my last book was with Duke, which was very slow, but very, you know, professional editing, da 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 da. And Nancy and Kate were going like, I had, kept saying, this isn't really totally normal. I mean, probably isn't new normal, but that as authors um, and editors, we do have to do a lot of work. So I want to thank them in particular for that, but also um, all of our authors that just got back again and again. It's fantastic. So, Tess, do you want to open the floor? Unmute, darling. Far out, Brussels sprout. Um, <laughs> you'd think after all these weeks of being on Zoom, I'd be an addict, but hopeless. Um, yes, now, people listening in, if you're interested um, to ask our fantastic panellists here and editors some questions about the book. How am I going to do this? Yes, I think you meant to like put your little hand up. <laughs> or if you can't put the hand up, then you can type Q or question in the chat. Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll monitor the chat. Um, I mean, I can also, whoops, um, open it. There are other authors here. Um, Kate, do you want to have a, have a, a say? <laughs> or a Strida. Or a Strida, or, yeah, this view, I can only see that many. Um, By Kate, did you mean me? Uh, Barclay. Yes. <laughs> um, well, Pat. Uh, Sonia, I noticed, is, is here too. And Sonia too, yeah. And, her, and she's the first author of it. Yeah, so Sonia, um, where are you? She's here, but her video is off. Oh, okay. Oh, she's here, yeah. Oh, Sonia, yeah. did you want to say something about your experience being an author in this collaboration? No. <laughs> it's a bit, uh, we have competing Zoom interests in this house. <laughs> um, I think um, I can hardly bring anything new because it's my first collaborative authorship so as a junior researcher. So for me, it's the whole process of converging interests from with actors from different disciplines who have such different looks into the ocean and our text is in the book is a is a policy piece and where I have trouble from a literary background to a regulation background and I admire the people in this book who have done it with more grace than I could do it and I at the same time, I'm very thankful to Kate and Rob who could pull a junior researcher, uh, junior researcher into authorship and guide it through an array of texts and finding a voice that could blend into with the others, which was one of the most difficult things I had to do with in the papers, which was how to position a voice that could the same time deal with a fairly dry piece of policy and talk and speak to other voices across the spectrum so yeah and the success of the editors in bringing all of these voices together and producing such a cohesive work that's yeah. really what has impressed me the most That's so interesting. Um, the question that Elspeth had pot potentially put to everybody, um, which which has been touched on a little bit, there were two questions that she thought 
um, people might want to think about. One was how is, you know, COVID making people think differently about their research on the sea? And uh, Amaya touched on that a little bit. But also then how your research um, provokes and makes us complicate questions of sustainability. But I think really we've had um, some interesting grabs at that already. So I am interested in hearing from more of the authors because yeah. we have some of them here. Um, I might just, um, before I'm going, to, I just saw that Mieli um, is here too. Um, yeah, I, I think what is very interesting and is brought up a lot in the newspapers is, oh, look how clean um, the oceans are, you know, and, and it's true. I mean, we go for walks down by Ramsgate Beach and I even go swimming there because there's no planes, you know. Um, but of course, as we know, that, that is, that, that's a mirage in a way. Um, so I think post-COVID space will be about uh, mobilizing that in Adriana's optimistic view of look, look what happens in, in so short a time, but also look, look what is to be done. Yeah. Now, Mia Lee, are you there? Can Beth, I get a James, James has a question in the chat. Oh, okay. All right, James, go for it. Hi, um, really enjoying this. It's so interesting and like fresh, give me something fresh new and new to think about. Um, I was just wondering, I really liked what you said about um, the NGO, um, the opportunity for NGOs to embrace complexity in their messaging and like the compl complexity can be sexy. Um, coming from like a copywriting background, that's like quite countercultural to all of the kind of media and I mean, there's a reason that all the um, complexity gets taken out of that messaging. Um, but I really, you know, I get really frustrated at that in that space. I'm wondering if you have any examples of um, where, like, the sexiness of complexity has been successful, maybe particularly in the seas or in other different areas. Um, well, I'll kick off and then I might draw in my colleague, Estrida. Um, yeah, they, at the conference, for instance, we had a really interesting panel that um, Kate had organised. So we had um Kat, uh Kat's last name is escaping me, um, who worked for Greenpeace for a long time. Um, John Sussman, who's um a marketing guru, um, works for the like top sea buyer sea fish fish buyers, um a fisherman from uh the north coast and uh, Tony Weir, a big buyer for one of the major supermarket um, fish companies, Peterson's. And I thought they were going to go for each other. You know, I really was expecting blood. Um, and in fact, uh, brought together in this sphere, and Kate did a really lovely job uh, of, of sharing, we got visions of, of complexity that were acknowledged even though these uh, players would have been placed in opposite opposition to each other often. So I think that the, the, that sort of um, getting it, operationalizing it, I mean, it's easy to say, yes, complexity is, is sexy and it is because, you know, as you know, many of us do research that takes from this and this and this and and you, you've got just such a multifaceted wonderful um you know you know trying to stretch your understanding at the very edges of your brain type of work you know um but then you see it operationalized in in these conversations and i think it was i think that sort of um ultimately um pretty optimistic really Astrid, are you there? I am. Yeah, hi. Um, nice to see you all and congratulations to you, Elspeth, and to Nancy and Kate. Uh, such an amazing book. And I'd like to actually start by recalling what an amazing conference it was. You know, this came out of, um, I think, one of, the, one of the best events I've attended, you know, at the University of Sydney in the last five years. 
And I'd like to say on the question of the complexity, um, and this relates to why it was such a good conference, complexity doesn't just get effectively communicated, you know, by accident, you know. I think this kind of interdisciplinary work in the book is also importantly the product of really good curatorial skills, right? So like the way people, it's not just, just that you brought these different people together, but you chose them specifically and you set up the conversations and then that's replicated in the book through really interesting placing of different kinds of chapters side by side. And I think that um, we sometimes underplay, you know, as interdisciplinary scholars, like what a skill and labor that actually is, you know, to do really good interdisciplinary work. It's not just about shoving a whole bunch of things together, but, you know, how we communicate that. Um, so I just really wanted to sort of doff my hats to you. My, no, I'm only, I'm not even wearing a hat. <laughs> doff my one non-existent hat to you for that um, really wonderful thing that you did. It was, it was truly interdisciplinary. You know, us academics often say our work is interdisciplinary because we bring a few people together, but there were lawyers and fishers and indigenous uh, scholars and practitioners and artists and poets and architects. Like it really was amazing. Um, so I think I'll just stop there, but I just really wanted to point out that sort of aspect of the, the complexity that it, it is also in the way that you have curated this particular collection and the way you've engaged certain people across conversations that I think has really um, made it such a success. Well, high praise indeed from someone who does so much inventive and innovative um, organizing. And um, I've got to say, of course, it was helped greatly by lots of vino and, um, and I, if I recall rightly, the catering was really good too. Of course it was. <laughs> um, and I um, mean, this is, this would be the moment that we, you know, bring in Michelle. Um, uh, I mean, if there are no more questions, uh, and I know that it's hard to ask a question at book launch come presentation when you haven't read the book. Um, and it's also sadly really expensive still, but it is an ebook, and um, certainly Fisher has a copy, copy so that's good. Um, so if there are any more questions, I can't. No, I can't see Maybe. any hands. Can I Sorry? say something more, Elspeth? Um, just while <laughs> yeah. I thought about it, um, I just wanted to uh, emphasize the point that Adriana made earlier about how it's also spawned additional, you know, interesting collaborations. And I think that's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something that um, was one of the most delightful things about it. I, I got in touch with Adriana not so much later and found myself snorkeling in, in Little Bay with her doing footage for a, a little film I was putting together. So, you know, I think these kinds of um, risky adventures of extending your tentacles across, you know, unfamiliar disciplines can yield all sorts of wonderful and surprising results. Um, so, so thanks again for being the, you know, the, the start of that. Well, I mean, I've benefited greatly. I was um, emailing Sean Lavery, who has the um, last word, um, thinking from the Southern Ocean, um, this morning about a, a project she wants me to come in on about um, the underwater of the Indian Ocean. Um, and hopefully, if that comes off, I will then be, be talking to Miali, who is um, from Les Îles de la Réunion, um, although finishing a PhD right now in Geneva and working on the Western tuna. So the other great thing is that um, so many um, um, emerging ECIs, MCIs, um, that um, made this all thing. So I think that's fantastic. So Tess, what do you think? Yeah, I will. I just want to make one more point about the book and to hear from our actual launcher but one more point I'd make about the book which is that it is also 
predominantly female voices. There's a diversity in, in those voices, but there's a majority of female voices. And I'll always remember Elspeth being challenged when she was given the provocation, how does gender relate to this interest of yours in fishing? And, uh, you know, your own book later and now this collection. I hope that that question can be can have a sock put in it, to be honest, um, <laughs> finally, because it's also showing that, in fact, this is a set of concerns that exceeds, um, you know, the nonsense that the sea itself is already, is already owned and it is already gendered in a predetermined way. All right, so um, I think that we have one more part of this program today, which is to have the book launched properly. Yes, could um, I make a little point? I wanted to, <laughs> sorry, uh, Miali here. Oh, Miali. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was, um, the baby was, yeah. Um, My baby. I would, I, I just, <laughs> no, I know, I'm trying to hide her. <laughs> Are you in Geneva? I wanted <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I'm like at the end of my PhD, so I wanted to thank uh, Esbeth and Kate especially because I was in the second year of my PhD uh, at the conference, um, and this was definitely the best conference during my five years of PhD. I still remember every moment of it, uh, and I wanted to thank um, um, the organizers for like letting like such a junior researcher to be part of this project. And I thought that was really amazing to um, be part of like different uh, practitioners and also artists. I really enjoyed every part of it. I think my message about the book is um, that we do need those different visions, especially in a field like mine, which is just about a highly valued commodity. Um, so it's usually just about capitalist exploitation. And I think uh, something that is maybe uh, less not less positive, but in my field, it's more about the trade-offs that if we want to sustain um, the resources that, and ourselves, it's, there is, at least in tuna fisheries, no win-win, that we need to make sacrifice and that might be about capitalism. Um, that might be about our like, economic interest. Um, and it's something that we need to do thinking about the fish and it's the people that depend on it too. So I really, I'm really thankful that um, I've been able to convey that message that is quite really difficult because in a field that like um, is about food and is about high money, it's, it's usually portrayed as a win-win, that it can be a win-win for everybody. And if we want to like sustain our seas, I think we have to also be ready to not be a win-win so that people some some like stakeholders may lose in it and i thought that was my message for this chapter so that was all and thanks a lot again for the opportunity and looking forward to more work together thank you that's a lovely um a lovely wrap mm -hmm. so michelle i believe it's your moment yes thank you very much um well first of all thank you to elspeth nancy and kate for inviting me to launch this book. When Elsa sent me the invitation, I first thought she might have made a mistake. <laughs> I was wondering, <laughs> and so I was very flattered. Um, and I think in particular, being just over the cusp into a mid-career researcher from an early career researcher, I think it's an, an incredible privilege to launch a book with such a high caliber of um, authorship and some fantastic works within the book. So my research, I always find it a little bit hard to classify myself as to what disciplinary background I have. And I think my main motivation is always the oceans and um, a huge interest in the oceans and fascination with the oceans. So I'm pretty happy to explore and embrace and learn from all the different disciplinary approaches to looking at the oceans. So for someone like me, this book was just an absolute joy. Um, and the first thing that struck me about it, having gone to the conference when it was sustaining the, the seas, um, as El Elspeth mentioned um, early on, was how the the was absent. And straight away, it, I mean, this quite subtle change has a really big impact in 
the way you think about the works within it because it kind of takes you from this I think traditional approach to thinking about our relationships to the oceans, particularly people having worked in, in government and um, research as being the caregivers or the people trying to fix the oceans to a much more reciprocal kind of relationship that we're sustained by the seas um, and we also have this duty of care to, to um, sustain the seas or do what we can to sustain the seas. And the next thing that struck me, which I think has been touched on again and again by every, every speaker, was just the huge diversity of topics and disciplines and ontologies that it traverses. And so anyone interested in the oceans, that works in the oceans, that loves the oceans, will find a chapter that they feel really comfortable in, in this, in this collection, whether they're a natural scientist, a social scientist, an engineer, an artist, um, a lawyer, it's, it, it covers all these different approaches. But they'll also, I think really importantly, find chapters that they feel less at home in. And that's why I'd really encourage anyone that gets, the, that reads the book to read the whole book and to not just to pick the chapters that they feel most comfortable with, because it pulls on all kinds of psychological threads, it prods at your preconceptions and it expands, expands your, your division out or it focuses it right in um, and it challenges those disciplinary boundaries um, with unfamiliar language and different ways of thinking. So I thought to illustrate that point I would draw on a quote actually from chapter 22 my esteemed colleagues at University of Wollongong who had a lovely chapter looking at um, interdisciplinary songwriting and with a bit of poetic license, they're talking about this process of interdisciplinary um, work on, in writing song, which is fascinating. Um, but with a bit of poetic license, they could equally be talking about the experience of reading this book. And so they say, this, as in interdisciplinary research, requires each collaborator to experience a degree of disciplinary discomfort, faced with unfamiliar expertise, and accept that the emphasis and focus may continue to shift through time. The process took us beyond the scope of our individual experience, skills and knowledge, but more importantly, it granted us a freedom to reach beyond our customary practices and disciplinary conventions. So sustaining seas mixes the familiar with the unfamiliar and everyone's experience of that will be different depending on what's the area of familiarity. But the combined experience of reading all the chapters is um, to get a really much deeper appreciation of the diverse perspectives and notions of care and caregiving that exists around the oceans. And that can only be a good thing. Uh, we, as we're all needing to better understand, appreciate, recognise and protect the way that the sea sustain us and understand the ways that we can sustain the sea. So I really highly commend the book to anyone who is sustained by the oceans and that's pretty much all of us, well it is all of us. <laughs> um, and so without going on too much longer, I would, I'm very um, proud and privileged to have the pleasure of announcing it officially launched. <laughs> And now unmute and clap everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you all. And um, we have a separate party room, um, <laughs> a Zoom virtual drinks room from anyone who wants to move to that. I think you've all got the, um, uh, the link. Um, but if not, um, let me know or um, Tom know. Um, so maybe we'll convene in a f about five minutes and, and raise a glass to, uh, to us all to the end of another long week. But really, I can't, um, I can't say thank you enough for the, the generosity that um, of the authors of our a static levitating chair, Tess, um, and to you all for coming. So thanks very much and see you in another Zoom room soon.